Welcome back to the channel. We are out in the bog tending to the bees. We have hopped straight from winter into spring here in Alaska. It's been amazingly warm this last week. Today, I think we're gonna peak in the mid thirties or so. So it's perfect temperature to check on our friends. We have two beehives behind me. They're both still alive from what I can tell, but I don't know exactly how they're doing. So that's what we're checking on today. And first thing we're doing is just getting some of the snow cleared off around them. You can see there's a lot of snow out here still. I'm burying them in all this here. And they've left all the snow on them. Well, here they are, our two insulated beehives. We have been very cautious to remove snow this winter. In fact, I really haven't removed any. I've just been keeping their entrances clear. The bees themselves haven't been doing that many cleansing flights, which is a little odd to me, but I don't, I don't know what that means. So that's why I, I wanna get in there. We have to take the tops off. We've gotta remove the quilt box and then we'll be able to assess the hives and see, see how they're doing, see if they still have food, see how big they are. I may also be clearing their entrance and just making sure there's not dead bees built up at the bottom, which there probably is. And then we're gonna spread ash when we're all done with this area. I'm sure that thoroughly made them mad. You can see this is pretty disruptive, which is why we don't do this at all in the winter months. But being that it's mid-March, uh, they've almost completely overwintered. So this year we tried something a little different. We put a little bit of extra insulation on the top. We usually wrap them in an inch to two inches, whatever we have, but we put additional on the top to kind of help with the uh, keeping the heat inside there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take them off now. I'm a little scared. Is it? I feel like it's stuck. Well, that we gotta work kind of quickly though. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything yet. I don't really want to let like all this. No. So since they're not alive, I don't have to be like uh, I don't have to work that quickly because. I'm not letting out the heat for anyone that's living. So they're clearly not alive. They've always been a little bit quieter than this other hive, but I was pretty sure I heard them still. Clearly I was wrong. <laughs> you can see kind of what happened in here. They really didn't make it to their sugar. They didn't eat that much of this candy board. Um, usually they would have eaten a lot more than that. I'm guessing they died a little while back then and I just didn't notice it. This is where the cluster was on these frames. But the first thing that I'm noticing that's like kind of a red flag is there's a lot of bee poop in here, which kind of goes with what I was saying earlier. They weren't taking cleansing flights in the winter and they haven't taken one that I know of, especially this hive. I haven't seen any bees come out of the entrance, perhaps for me not coming out here and keeping their entrance clear, or perhaps there was just something else going on with the hive. That is sad, but this hive did have some problems going into winter. So I'm guessing they died a while back. Okay, I know this may be kind of saddening, but what I'm doing is just kind of investigating a little bit to see maybe as to why they died. That's kind of a really important part. Uh, overwintering in Alaska is really hard. And if you can be successful, you want to figure out as to why they were successful. And if you weren't successful, you want to figure out maybe why that was the case. And there's a lot of things happening in this hive that are not good so far. Uh, this shows, I believe, that they were looking for food and they starved because their butts are pointing out of the comb like they were looking for food. There's quite a bit of moisture, which is never a good sign. You don't really wanna see mold and frost. That means that there was like some ventilation issues. It can mean a few other things. It could have been the moisture in their honey when it was capped. All in all, it's not looking good, <laughs> but they're definitely not alive. I had Eric pull this frame out and we, we checked the bottom box too, and there's nothing in there, just dead bees. We wanted to make sure they weren't on the bottom. There's mold on them. They've been dead for a while. I think we found where the actual cluster was when they died. They were over here. 
They probably couldn't, they were too small, so they couldn't break away and get food. It really looks like they probably died a while back and I just was pretend hearing them through the foam. I always come out here and do a little hearing check, but I don't know, I must have been hearing this high because they're pretty loud. So let's hope those ones are alive at least. This is our fourth winter with bees here in Alaska. The first winter, our two hives didn't make it. We didn't do as much as I think we could have done to prep them. The second year, both of the hives did make it and pull through. Last winter or last year, we had three hives. I thought all three of them were gonna make it, but one of them ended up dying pretty much right around this exact time. So they made it all the way through most of winter, but then just something happened right at the end. So that's probably about a 50% success rate. I think that's pretty common. Doesn't sound very good, and that's probably because it's not very good. We're trying to increase that. We're gonna put this all back together for now, and nothing is gonna be wasted. There is still really good resources in here for other bees, like all of this comb. See how, uh, how moist that is? That is a lot of moisture in there. It's like yeah. frozen, it's hard. Not good. There shouldn't be that much moisture. This is a quilt box that's meant to absorb moisture like that, but I've never felt them be that moist and that wet. Uh, there's a candy board in here and that should have absorbed some of the moisture from the hive. No, I'm not, I don't want anyone to get stung. It's really cold, so they shouldn't be like trying to, it's okay, it's not great. I'm really surprised they haven't eaten more sugar than that. Okay, now we can chat about that. <laughs> that looked good. Um, the hive clearly has started to eat in one corner. They've eaten that candy board and they've also are eating it in the middle where I left like a little ventilation uh, when I made the candy board mold. I didn't get an exact size, but I think the cluster was like this big. That's good. That's not bad, right? That's not that small. And they were clearly eating and able to break for food. So that's good. Obviously, I don't know if there's a queen in there. I don't know if they're raising brood or anything yet. We won't know that till later on. Eric and I are actually going to be taking a trip and that's why I made the decision to do this check now. Otherwise you could wait, you could wait a little bit, but I was a little concerned as to why I'm not seeing them do cleansing flights. Definitely makes sense for the other hive because they weren't living, but this hive, they haven't really been doing that many cleansing flights either. And there is a lot of moisture in there. Doesn't seem to be a problem though. And I didn't see a lot of poop, so we are going to do what we said. We're gonna keep this area clean, spread some ashes, and hopefully this hive can get out and do some cleansing flights and be off to a good start for this spring. It's looking like leaving all of this snow packed around the hives has restricted their ventilation. So I'm pretty sure there was like almost no ventilation except for the little portion of the entrance reducer that was open. So what we're gonna do is take off the entrance reducer and we're gonna kinda see if there's any dead bees in there and try to clear them out. And then we've opened up the front so there's a little more ventilation in there for them. There it goes. There it goes. Last year's hive died about the same time this year which made me kind of want to try something different. Therefore, we left a bunch of snow around them. And I can tell you it's definitely probably attributed to some of the issues we're seeing because these bees are moldy, wet, and frozen, which is just not good. There's too much, too much moisture. There's not enough ventilation. So it's definitely cleared out now. They can get some good airflow. There was actual frozen bees on the bottom, which is probably why they couldn't get out and do any cleansing flights. I'm glad we made the decision to come in here and address this. Now I know where they stand. We've got one hive that appeared moderately strong, so we'll, we'll see if they make it another month. I think that's pretty good. I got about half of it cleared. Looking good. Do you still hear them? We've got the ash spread so the sun can melt the snow in this area. It works impeccable if you haven't tried it before. This time of the year we have warm day temperatures, but then it does drop back down at night, which does make it challenging for the bees to survive this next month with those great fluctuations. In the fall, when we were prepping these bees, I was already kind of hemming and hawing whether I wanted to take them on our move. And this, you know, now that we're down to one hive, that's definitely given me something to think about. So I think we're all done out here. We're gonna clean up and head back.
How long do you think this is gonna take? I don't even wanna think about it. An hour at least. Thank you. Oh yeah, look at that. Definitely was a more in its prime a long time ago. There's some uh not so <laughs> here. Just take that. That one's green. We are starting the long and tedious process of going through our garlic from last year's growing season. We harvested it in the fall and we were storing it inside the cabin. And garlic usually can store very long, six months to a year if you're storing it in the right conditions. Our cabin is not really the right conditions. So fortunately we're running into some bad ones. Yeah, this one right here is soft. Like, look at that, completely squishy. So we're setting those aside. We're gonna do some with those maybe for the chickens. Well, we are running into some really good ones here. So we've already got a nice bowl of some garlic. Look at that head. I'm looking at that moldy one. No, but look at that one. We have the little garlic rollers, silicone rollers, and those work really well too, especially when the garlic's fresh. This garlic is of course old, so it does fall out of its husk or the paper coating pretty easily yeah. because it's shrunken up, lost some of that moisture. But the jar method works really well. If you've never tried it, you just put the cloves in a jar. Maybe like a quarter full. You don't want to put too many in there. It doesn't work that well for fresh garlic though. It's yeah. pretty hard on that. It's working good for now, but there is no real way of getting around it. Peeling this much garlic is a lot of work. How are we doing on solar? Pretty wicked. Filling up every day. Oh yeah, very wicked. We're almost done. I'm pretty sure it's been an hour and a half at least, and we've only taken a few garlic slivers underneath the fingernails, so this is not that fun. We're almost there though. Well, we finished up and we ended up with about 10 to 12 cups, which is awesome. We have a bowl over here that is probably gonna be composted because those are not looking very good. This is hard neck garlic, so that's why some of these are really, really big cloves. And it doesn't store as long as soft neck garlic. We probably should have done this sooner. They really didn't store that long this year. We have a few fun ways we're going to be preserving them. We're gonna do some fermenting in honey, some pickling, and also roasting and freezing them in oil. I've gotta get these all rinsed and cleaned up and just make sure that we don't have any bad ones in here. So we have fermented garlic before, but we haven't made fermented honey garlic. And that is what we're doing today. We have some honey that we harvested from the bees and we have yet to go through all of it. So we figured this would be the perfect opportunity. Honey is a powerhouse as you know, and so is garlic. So they're gonna combine and ferment and we are going to end up with just a powerhouse recipe here. It is so simple. I've never done it before, but I've just read that you wanna kind of bruise or crush the garlic a little bit. I'm kind of crushing it a little bit more because we're not using fresh garlic. We're using it a little bit older. So I wanna make sure that the juices do in fact release. And the liquid from the garlic is what's going to start and help that fermentation process along. So I'm just gonna fill up these mason jars. I'm not gonna fill them up all the way because we have to add honey. And we also wanna leave room for the bubbling or fermenting process. We don't want it to spill over, so. I'll probably add a little bit more to this one. You can probably tell that our honey is a little bit crystallized. This must have happened in the last like month or so. Right, we keep it down in a very cool area of our house, but that's not gonna be a problem. You could probably heat it up if it was all the way crystallized. I don't think that's gonna be an issue for this at all. It's gonna take a while for it to work down through the garlic. And at this point, you do have to kind of turn the jar upside down, make sure that the garlic is covered all the way. I 
I'm gonna let these come to room temperature. I probably should have pulled that honey out before so it wasn't as thick. And I think I'm gonna make one more jar. I'm pretty excited for this. Again, we're not using fresh garlic. Ideally you would, we're using aged garlic. So I think it should all still be okay for the fermenting process. I wanna make sure these are good to go though before I put them aside and let them start the fermenting. These look great, they have warmed up and I probably overfilled them just a tad. We use three cups of honey for these, so not really that much honey. And at this point, what you want to do during the beginning fermentation stages is you close the, the lid and you flip the honey over with the garlic and you let it kind of like drop down and make sure that all the garlic is getting coated. And you wanna probably do that from what I've read for the first few days. You can check if it's already starting the process and bubbling. You can give it a burp and just unscrew it, let it release the air and then close it right back up. I imagine these are gonna start fermenting within the first week. That's about how long I'm gonna leave them out on the counter, just keeping an eye on them. And then I'm gonna move them down to our cold storage. And I've been told you want to make sure that you have some sort of like cookie sheet underneath these, because if you've ever fermented and had something overfill or bubble over, you can imagine it would probably be a nightmare with sticky garlic honey. Very excited to try this. I. Sure, you can imagine there's a bunch of different ways you could use this, but we're gonna have to wait about a month until we can enjoy this and we will keep you posted on how it turns out. This next one could not be more simple. We are just going to be roasting a whole bunch of whole cloves in the oven and I'm gonna roast them quite a bit because I want the oil to be really flavorful. If you've ever chopped up garlic and roasted it in oil for a long time, you get such a good flavor. And then we are going to be freezing these in jars afterwards. You can store garlic in olive oil. You just have to be really careful about how you do it. And we haven't actually gone through that process ourselves. Because I don't wanna worry about that, I am just choosing to freeze it, which we have done before, and then it will be preserved and good to go for when I wanna grab it and bring it out for a meal. Well, these uh, smell and look fantastic. I'm really glad we tried doing it this way. Eric and I always prefer fresh garlic, so freezing it and then eating it that way is not our preferred method, but it's late in the season, so we gotta figure out what we wanna do with uh, this garlic. And I think this is gonna be really delicious. We're gonna have that awesome infused oil when we go to pull it out of the freezer. I'm gonna to top this last one off with a little bit of olive oil. It doesn't need to be hot, of course, because they're just gonna be frozen. You wanna leave just a little bit of room for expansion. I find that half pints don't, I've never lost one in the freezer. They don't really expand that much. We're gonna let these cool outside and then we'll move them into the freezer. Without a glove, huh? I forgot to mention how long these cooked for. I think it was about 25 minutes at 400 degrees. And next up, we're working on pickling our garlic. We saved the most garlic to pickle. We've done a little bit of pre-measuring. I think we should end up with 10 pints and each one should probably take about a cup or so of vinegar. In the past, we have pressure canned our pickled garlic. And I wasn't a really big fan of that because you lose lots of the benefits of the garlic for the long processing time. Personally now, I am super comfortable doing a process called open kettle because we are virtually pickling them in 100% vinegar. So I'm not at all concerned about that. And what we're gonna be doing is just heating up some jars. We're gonna raw pack the garlic in them and then I'm going to put very hot vinegar on top of them and put a lid and band them and seal them.
So we have to make sure to work really quickly for this process for the seal to be created. We're using that scalding hot jar and the very hot vinegar. We're using all white distilled vinegar. Sometimes it takes a few hours for it to actually create the seal. And once I know that they are sealed, I will be able to store them and put them away. They are shelf stable as is right now. Pickled garlic is actually awesome. It's a great way to preserve it. I know you may think that they would end up very pickled tasting, but for some reason, the oils in the garlic, it just doesn't penetrate the garlic that much. And when you go to pull these out, if you, especially if you rinse them with a little bit of water, you can cook with them just as normal and it really doesn't have a pickled flavor. And sometimes you may find that you'll get a little bit of a blue green color on the bottom portion of the cloves. Nothing to worry about. We have had that happen before. I'm not sure it's gonna happen with this method of preserving them, but it's just a, a reaction that is going on with the garlic, but it's not a cause for concern. We're just about done with our garlic and we are going to get started on our potatoes. So a time of year where we are clearing out our pantries, so to speak, and just kind of assessing what we have been storing through the winter months. Some years things store better based upon how they grew, when they were harvested, how they were cured, and then of course, how you were storing them. So we do not have a great method to store our potatoes. Last year, we actually ate through all of them. This year, we are looking to can these. They have been stored in our dungeon slash cupboard, so it's a cool area, but you can tell that they're sprouting. I put the soft ones aside for the dogs and the chickens. And the ones that are still good and hard, we are going to process for us. Hand them to you to shuck. And I'll shuck them. Okay, this will be my peel bowl. Yeah, I'll just compost this. Like an old pirate. No, honestly, I, I don't mind peeling potatoes. The garlic was not good. How are your nails feeling? Oh, my hands hurt. Gosh, you're so fast. I thought you were chopping. Canning potatoes is actually very simple. The hardest part, I think, is the fact that we're doing so many. So I've got a huge pile of skins here and we're gonna be pressure canning these today. First thing we're gonna do is give these a good rinse. We're gonna chop them up into the size that we want, probably about one inch squares. We're gonna boil them for about two minutes and then we're gonna strain them, put them in jars, add clean, hot water, and then they're going to the pressure canner. Three more potatoes. Good job. The little ones. I think we could just mix the purple ones in this time because there's not that many. I Last time we kept them separate, but... No, I would too. Take my time. Here. <laughs> Looks like we ended up with a lot of potatoes, which is awesome. I really like canned potatoes and we're gonna do these in quarts. We're gonna put them all in jars first. So all of the potatoes and then we're gonna pressure can them. We have two pressure canners. They're gonna go for 40 minutes. Our first batch of potatoes is done and we have to let them cool. They went for 40 minutes at 11 pounds. We have four more jars to process. And before we start on dinner, I have to take care of something that we've been needing to do and that is make my fermented mustard seeds into mustard. And we are choosing to make Dijon mustard. This is half brown seeds and half yellow. I think they use either black 
mustard seeds or brown mustard seeds, so it's not a true Dijon, but it's still gonna be delicious. We fermented these probably about a month ago. We had them sitting on the counter for about three weeks and then I moved them over to the fridge. They fermented super fast with that whey that I added in. Um, they're not as fizzy now, so I'm gonna strain this out. You can tell I'm using a blender, but the proper way to do this is use a mortar and pestle, which I don't have. So I am going to add a little bit of water to this now since we are using a blender. And a few other ingredients I'm adding is two tablespoons approximately of white wine. I have two tablespoons that I'm gonna be adding of white wine vinegar and a little bit of sugar and salt. We're going to run this through this sieve now and get a really awesome texture. Well, that's what we ended up with. And this is fermented Dijon mustard. So we are going to be keeping it in the fridge. We're not gonna be canning it or anything like that. This is what we were left with. So a little bit of residue, I guess. I'm just gonna be composting that. And it's delicious. It, uh, it has a good flavor. Tonight we're gonna to be making German potato dumplings with the last of our potatoes. So I have those steaming. We've never made this before, but it sounds absolutely delicious. Next, I have a day old little chunk of sourdough. We're gonna cut this up and we're gonna make toasted breadcrumbs and brown butter. Oh, got me in the eye. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's how you know it's good. Our potatoes have been riced. So these German dumplings are fairly simple, it looks like. We have our potatoes, we're gonna do nutmeg in there, a little salt, a couple eggs, and some flour, and that's pretty much gonna be the dumplings. And our croutons are absolutely delicious. They were cooked in that butter, so now we have brown butter in that dish. And I'm gonna chop these up real fine, and we're gonna end up topping these dumplings with a little bit of these toasted breadcrumbs and brown butter. All right, let's give this a go. We're gonna roll these into balls and we're gonna be boiling them. I'm gonna use wet hands. Hope we don't get any stickage. Those look awesome. And these went for probably about 20 minutes and I flipped them a couple times in there, but they're not done yet. We're gonna top these and we're gonna eat dinner. It has been a long day and the potatoes, the canned potatoes turned out awesome. And my favorite way of using these is actually just like fried up in the morning with some eggs, but we also use them in soups, chowders. You can make potato pancakes. The sky's the limit with these things. We haven't made those in two years, so we didn't get to make those last year. It's nice to have them again. Every year really differs. The garden produce does not last forever as we know. So this time of the year, we're like 
looking at our canned food, we're looking at our freezer food, we're going through the produce to see what we can preserve and make things with. I'm super excited for this meal. I am like sitting here <laughs> and I'm trying to concentrate on what you're saying, but I just get the smell of these. It smells so Dude, good. Dude, you eat these ones bigger. Yeah, oh, I see, you, I see you reach for them anyway. So brown butter on top with the breadcrumbs for a little crunch. German potato dumplings. Let's do it. This is the first for us. They're fluff, and they, fluffier than I thought they, they were They cook for a really long time. Whoa. This recipe is really heavy on butter and the sourdough crouton little bits. <laughs> it's just like you would think toasted in the, in the butter and the sourdough bread. It's a just it's so good. I don't even think that made sense what I said, but it's it's delicious. I really like it. I don't, should we add a little, I don't know if we should add a little more flour, but I really like it. It's a good consistency. It's awesome. To me, it tastes a lot like chicken and dumpling soup. Mm -hmm. If you made dumplings and like chicken soup, but there's a lot of potato in here. And so. there's nothing to rise. Yeah, these are awesome. There's I really like these. Yeah, I got some of the fermented mustard I want a little bit on here. That's... Personally, I just love the, the topping. <laughs> It's really good. It, honestly, if I ate that, I wouldn't think there was potato in there. It tastes really more taste like a dumpling in and a soup. I wanted a little bit of this mustard on my texture. It tastes more like, but yes, it's more like a, a dumpling. Like or a, a wet, custard. A wet dumpling. Here's to our potatoes. Cheers. Cheers. We were super hungry today. It's been, like Eric said, a long day, like 12 hours or so in the kitchen. We're going to enjoy the rest of dinner. And we'll see you guys in the next video. I know, I like the it. The breadcrumbs look like it. bacon bits. I do think chives. Oh. If we had them, because I was saying that's like common, that would have been probably the the final touch. You know what this would be good on? Is if you made like fettuccine alfredo, and you had one of these on top. Carbs on carbs, yeah. Doesn't mm -hmm. that just sound good? It's delicious. All right, that's a wrap, everybody. Go home. Do you like it with the mustard? Yeah, it's really good. <laughs>